Today is Thursday, March 21st, and I'm here to talk to my guy, Frankie Vitorini, about the New York Jets. It's our Thursday night show where we talk about the New York Jets and all things that are going on. Frankie, we're in a much different position compared to last Thursday. How you doing, man? How you feeling? I am feeling fantastic, man. I am feeling so damn good. The sun's coming out in New York, and Joe Douglas proves yet again why he's one of the best GMs in football, baby. Get it right. Put some respect on his name because Joe D brings talent to this team. And this is our year. This is our year because of that, man. Not you. So, Actually, it might be because of you because you're a good energy guy. But Joe D, baby. Joe D. Listen, I think I'll take a little bit of the L on the fact that I didn't have a good vibe about this Jets a couple weeks ago when we when we did this show a couple weeks ago. But then last week I said, go get Tyron Smith. And that's the move I want to start with right here. They went out and signed Tyron Smith last Friday. And this, to me, Frankie, was a no-brainer. This is an elite top five left tackle when healthy and on the field. And what gives you hope a little bit about signing a Tyron Smith with the Jets is it is an incentive-related deal. It wasn't a massive, you know, contract, ex- you know, where you give him three, four-year deals. You're giving him a one-year deal. And he gets to bet on himself a little bit. And the Jets in, the, in return are getting one of the best left tackles to protect Aaron Rodgers' this upcoming season. So... How do you feel about the Jets actually bringing in Tyron Smith and and solidifying this whole entire offensive re- offensive line rebuild? Man, it was the move that we were all looking for. So what do we all say before the offseason? Coming into free agency, Jet fans, what do we all say to each other? We want Tyron Smith or Robert Hunt or Mike and Wenu. We wanted one of those three guys, right? Well, we got one. We got Tyron Smith ranked on a lot of boards as the best, not only tackle or offensive lineman available, but the best quality player available. We can bring him in one year deal, heavily incentivized deal. It's incentive laden. He needs to play a certain amount of snaps to hit his certain marks and to get up to $20 million making a pro bowl matters. If the jets want a playoff game, that matters. This is a perfect deal for the New York Jets because what it does is it brings in a missing piece on this team and a piece that Aaron really needs in order for him to stay back there upright and him and 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 his best friend and Hackett being able to do what they want to do on offense. It gives them a lot of protection up front at the most important piece at left tackle. And it allows us to see next year if Tyron doesn't put it together and gets hurt. We're not tied up to a lot of money. So you bring him in for a year. It allows us maybe in the draft to go and get a tackle if we still want. It's a perfect situation. You get the best player in the draft uh, in free agency. You could draft whoever you want. And you got the left tackle down. I don't see a better situation for us. Yeah, Frankie, for me, it really, this was such a tall task that everyone was focused on, especially, you know, Jets fans and national media calling out this offensive line, considering we needed three new starters. And what did Joe Douglas do? He brought in John Simpson to be his left guard. He traded for Morgan Moses to be his right tackle. And then he went and signed the best left tackle in free agency in Tyron Smith, a guy, again, who has been a absolute monster at that position when he is healthy and when he's on the field. I think the key factor, and I wanted to ask you about this, he seemed to figure out last year, I think he played in 14 out of 17 games, he figured out a practice schedule that the Cowboys agreed to finally because that was something in the previous years he'd missed a ton of ton of football. And for him to be able to figure out that practice schedule where he's not so much doing team drills, he's not working a, a lot on the, you know, that set that sense of the practice and is doing his own thing to rehab and keep himself to be able to be healthy for these games. I think that's a big factor in this. And and if the jets agree to that same schedule, that practice schedule that Tyron Smith wants and that his body needs, I think you're going to have a healthy Tyron Smith for most of the season, man. I think so too. I mean, I have it up right here. He plays 38% of his snaps. He gets 750 K 44%. He gets 1.75 million, 50%, 2.75. And that's the first playtime incentive. Then he has a second playtime incentive in his contract that can go up to 98% of snaps that gets him up to 6.25 million. And he's just accumulating across the way. The first playtime incentive stops at 68%. He can get, if he plays those amount of snaps, he gets 5.75 million. Then it starts at the second tier 1.25 million if he hits 98 percent, it's 6.25 million plus 5.75 million he could max out this year at 20 million but he has to play so right. if he plays 
he's going to get paid. And what other situation would you want from a guy that when he does play, he's one of the best tackles in the game and he wants to get paid. So it works. It's a perfect situation. Is there any concern from your part that the Cowboys finally said, we're going to cut bait and they had, they, the, he played out a full contract extension. He, he got a massive deal with the Cowboys years and years ago. He played that entire deal out. And is there any concern on your part that the Cowboys were so willing to let him walk in free agency, considering how effective he was at left tackle for them? Yeah, a bit. And not even just the Cowboys, his market in general, Tyron Smith wasn't really what we had thought. So apparently Joe Douglas had offered a deal to Tyron Smith that the Jets themselves didn't actually think Tyron would accept. What does that tell you? There weren't really not many other offers on the table. And if they are, there were, they weren't maybe multiple year deals. I mean, if you're Tyron Smith, Ryan, wouldn't you want to take on a, on a deal that has some more, uh, you know, long-term duration to it that you can actually, even if you do get hurt, have some money that's guaranteed. Not with this deal. This deal, the only thing that's guaranteed is a $6.5 is guaranteed, and uh, depending upon how much he plays. So it is a little concerning as to what the medicals might actually be that a deal he took a deal that we didn't even think he was going to take. So that is, but you know what, man? I've been saying this for the last couple months. We are going to go into the season, and we're going to have to roll the dice somewhere. We're going to have to get lucky and hope that Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses stay healthy. AVT stays healthy. We're going to have to roll the dice, baby. Nothing's going to be picture perfect. We can't guarantee that we're going to have a healthy old line. We can't guarantee that our receivers are going to do X, Y, Z. You got to roll the damn dice. So, yes, there are some concerns, but that's why we were 7-10 and 10 last year. That's why people want the head coach out. So, I mean, you got to get lucky sometimes, right? I mean, like, uh, nothing's no, going to be perfect. It's it's a great point by you about getting lucky and rolling the dice and taking that chance. This is what we talked about all offseason is this team needs to be all in. And this is yeah. Joe Douglas being all in. He's taking that risk, giving that one-year deal to Tyron Smith. But, again, when that guy is healthy, he's one of the best in the NFL. Speaking of one of the best in the NFL, Mike Williams, one of the best wide receivers, hit the free agent market a little bit late after the Chargers decided to One of to the best, him. you think, Ryan? I mean, considering what the rest of that market was after Calvin Ridley had already signed. I oh, mean, you, as free agent wide receiver guy, like, I thought you were going one of the best wide receivers right, when, in the NFL. No, 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 no. When he entered free agency, he was one of the best in the market when it came to, to the wide receiver no, position. Group. Definitely. You but Tyron I mean? Smith's one of the best tackles in the game. Correct. Forget about Correct. just free agency. He's one of the best in the game. When you're talking about this market, though, Mike Williams, the Jets go bring him into a free agent visit. We saw how it went with NYJ Matt <laughs> sending him the Taylor, Taylor ham, egg and cheese sandwich. Uh, we saw the video of Mike Williams eating that sandwich. He said, that's what got me signed here. But all, all jokes aside, this is a difference maker. This is an actual weapon that Aaron Rodgers gets to throw the ball to. A guy that can win the 50-50 ball. He stretches the field. He barely drops the ball. He is a absolute monster on the field. And it actually gives you a little bit of a compliment in Garrett Wilson. You have an actual wide receiver that can take some of that double team off of Garrett Wilson and free him up a little bit. So, Frankie, what did you make of the move? The Jets decided to bring in, again, another guy who gets hurt quite a bit, but at the same time, when he's on the field, he's one of the best. Listen, man, I, I like the move. I like it. I don't love it maybe as much as other Jeff fans do. Why? He plays the exact same role for an offense as Alan Lazard plays. Now, if you were to tell me Alan Lazard is off this team next year, I love this move. If we're able to trade Alan Lazard tonight, tomorrow, in a week, I'm all for it. I would love the Mike Williams move. But because Alan Lazard is probably going to be lining up out there with Mike Williams, who's coming off an ACL, who's only four and a half months out of surgery, by the way. The timeline's uh, not really what I think some people think, but I'm not worried about that. But I'm just saying, you can kind of stack up these variables. It's not as picture perfect as we may think regarding his health and what he may be able to deliver. Um, and as an ex-receiver, like Alan Lazard is, I, I'm, I'm not completely content with the wide receiving core because we still did not address the position that you and I have been talking about for months now is slot receiver, right? Mike Williams is not a slot receiver. Alan Lazard's definitely not a slot wide receiver. Garrett's going to have to play in the slot. 
a little bit more than maybe I'd like him to. Xavier Gibson, are we going to depend on him? So I would have liked probably, a, I mean, I would have loved the receiver of Mike Williams' caliber who plays a little bit more inside, not someone who's an outside streak receiver that is coming but, off an ACL. That was never a much of a burner like people think. People think Mike Williams is like some burner. He, he's not a burner necessarily. Great, great high pointing, great high pointer, great in traffic, but I I need some more underneath. I I, I need more activity underneath, man. I hear you. I also think we didn't ever – Alan Lazard's never been Mike Williams in his career. You know what I mean? Like that – Mike Williams is one of the best, if not the best, wide receiver, too, in the NFL. He, I, that's that's undisputable. The fact – the stats are there. Yeah, he may play banged up. Yeah, he has a lot of nursing injuries. But at the end of the day, when he's out in the field, that guy, you throw the ball up to him, he's coming down with the ball. He, is, he barely drops the ball. And that's something the Jets desperately need when you consider what they had last season. We had a lot of drops from Lazard, a lot of drops – from Brownlee and Gibson and these guys, like those aren't real receivers. This is an actual receiving threat. And this also helps in the red zone. Your red zone is one of the worst in the NFL. Absolutely. You're talking about a big body target that Aaron Rodgers could throw the ball up to in the red zone. That's a big weapon to have for this Jets team that they haven't had in a while. Yeah. I'm just curious, like what is going to, what are we going to do with Lazard? I'm just saying, I don't I think, think he gets teams bumped are... down. He gets bumped down the depth chart. Yeah. Yeah. I, for, I hope so. I, I do. I hope he does get bumped down on the de- in in the depth chart. But is he is he going to like? Is that a reality? Yeah. Is 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 Hackett yeah. going to want to line him up with Mike Williams at the same time? I don't think teams are going to be scared of those guys on the field at the same time. They're going to put a little more emphasis on Mike. They'll do what they do with Garrett, I, I, and then Lazard m- might have you know open fields in front of him. And what's he going to do with the open field? So. That's where Conklin comes into play a little more. I want Tyler to really hit his next stage. Did have a nice year last year. He needs to do a lot across the middle and underneath. But, I mean, listen, I like the signing. I do. I'm just not, like, this head over heels fan because Mike Williams is here coming off an ACL that, again, he's four and a half months out. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Uh, a, a, a Debbie Downer. I'm just trying to... Um, give you realistic expectations as to what this offense outside of Garrett Wilson at, at the receiving end can actually give you because I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not as you know, goo goo gaga about Mike Williams because Alan Lazard will be out there and Tyler Conklin. I'm like, all right, nice. N- good. Not, not wow. Great. You know? So I think one, there's a couple things there. Lazard is ne- Lazard was overpaid. We all know that. His contract yeah. was absolutely absurd that the Jets gave him. They brought in Aaron Rodgers' buddy, and they said, yeah, we'll bring him in. We'll give him the contract. It's overpaid. Shouldn't be the, he, he shouldn't be getting paid what he is. He's getting paid like a wide receiver, too. He's not a wide receiver, too. The other thing with the Mike Williams contract, again, it's a one-year deal. You're giving a one-year deal yeah, to this guy with sure. not much guarantees there. So you're giving him a prove-it-year deal. So he needs to come out and prove to himself that he can go out in the field and still dominate and be a great wide receiver too. My other question, you, and, and the retort I would have to you is, is that has Garrett Wilson ever had a receiver like Mike Williams ever on the field with him on the in the offense in his career, in his short three-year career? Oh, no, not even close. Two-year career, I should say. Sorry. Two years, yeah. No, no. It's small sample size, but no. Okay, so I think that opens up so much. You want to talk about underneath stuff? That opens it up for Garrett Wilson. Yes, he'll still have some deep routes and things like that, but that's going to open it up for him. And Mike Williams is going to be opening up things for him, Tyler Conklin, and we'll turn to the next part of this conversation, the draft. You have options now. Because you brought in a left tackle and a wide receiver too, we no longer have to focus at number 10 and say, oh, we have to take the best wide receiver available. Oh, we have to take the best offensive tackle available. No, what instead now happens for Joe Douglas is – by taking these free agents and giving them one-year deals, you now can open up the possibilities at 10 and say, I have a lot of options here. I can trade back if I want to to get another second-round pick back, or I can take the best player available. And speaking of best player available, does this entice you a little bit further? I think think unless something crazy happens in that top 10, I see Brock Bowers there available at 10. Are you pulling the trigger on Brock Bowers, the best tight end prospect that's come out in a while? All right, so I'll break this down for you. The answer to your question is yes. However, it also depends on which left tackles are still available on the board. Because if Joe Alt or Olu Fashan who's available at 10, I'm taking either or. Alt's not going to be there, I don't think. 
Fashanu may. I'll take Fashanu over Bowers because I think Fashanu is that quality of a left tackle prospect for the long term. And I just love the value that he'd give us at 10. Now, I'd also take the other three receivers over Brock Bowers if they're there. It's close with the Dunze and Bowers because I do value what Bowers brings as a tight end option, but I would probably take the three receivers and Alton Fashanu if they're available over Bowers. But if they're not available, which could be the case, I'm going Brock Bowers because like I was saying earlier on Twitter, I was tweeting it out, posting it on U Stadium. Playing tight end in the NFL is one of the toughest things to do. Why? You have to play inside and out. You have to be an offensive lineman at times, but you have to be a receiver also at other times. You have to be able to be physical with linebackers, but you have to be able to uh, uh, get D-backs off balance and be able to properly run your routes. It's a very difficult position to play, but this guy Bowers does it, and he does it very well. And this sounds crazy. You know, I'm, I'm a little nutty, but I was watching the Dynasty doc the other night. And I was watching, I think, episode six. Episode six is with Aaron Hernandez. Now, I'm not comparing anything between Aaron Hernandez and Brock Bowers off the field. Obviously, it's terrible what happened. I'm comparing them on the field. Brock Bowers reminds me of an Aaron Hernandez type on the field. They run similarly. They they block similarly. They catch They high point balls in the red zone similarly. They remind me of each other. And Aaron Hernandez would have been a first-round pick if he didn't have all these off-field issues coming into uh, the NFL out of college, which the Patriots should have, you know, knew about. But that's another story. But Brock is great, man. But I'm still two left tackles in front of him, and I'm three receivers in front of him on my big board. And not counting the quarterbacks, because that's that's a ridiculous thing to go down. Well, I think it's – what you could look at here with the top 10, you know, four quarterbacks, no matter where going in the top 10, we, we four? know for, yeah. I mean, the fact that the Vikings got another first round pick, we saw the Cardinals GM admit yesterday that he's open to, to taking phone calls about someone, some team trading up. I think yeah. them or the chargers are looking to trade back or gather as many picks as possible. I think four quarterbacks are going in that top 10. We could see four quarterbacks going in the first four picks, no matter what, which is crazy. If that that's never ha- happened before. So let's say four quarterbacks go in the top 10. Would you agree? I would say three for sure. I'm not certain. I'm not for certain yet that McCarthy is going to be going in the top so 10. The Giants, the McCarthy hype then. Me personally, I don't see it. I think it's insanity to draft this but kid in the top 10. Are you buying the hype though, that he will get drafted in the top 10? Honestly, I, I, I'm not. Okay. I think it's all smoke screens. I, I, I cannot see a team looking at his film and what he threw 22 touchdowns last year. I didn't see anything from him where he drops back in the pocket, right? And he goes through read one, two, three, five to seven step drop. You don't see any of that, man. Everything's pre-scripted. He knows what his first read's going to be. Harbaugh had him running an offense that was just a well-oiled machine. How can you take this kid in the top 10? I think it's lunacy. So I I can't buy it because I think it's that crazy. For this exercise, though, I will say there's going to be four quarterbacks going in the top 10. I think there's too much noise around J.J. McCarthy going in the top 10. If four quarterbacks go in the top 10 and then the three receivers get taken, that's seven picks gone. You have the two offensive linemen. If both of them are happen to be selected before the Jets are at 10, they might be looking at Brock Bowers as their only option there at 10. You know what I mean? Or you're trading back. Yeah, it's just and if that, that, that's the thought and the noise, what you're currently hearing about the draft as we're heading into this for you know the draft date coming up. Do you think a defensive player will get selected in the top ten? Because it's it's hap- it, 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 it's never not happened where a defensive player wasn't taken in the top ten. This could be the first year. This yeah. could be the first year. If there's any year, it's this year that that, that were to happen. But it's never not happened before. Dallas the, Turner in the top ten. Yeah, does that is he worthy of a top ten pick? I like Dallas Turner a lot. I think with these offensive pieces, he may not be, but I don't know. It'd be yeah, I don't know. It, it, would be, it would have to be a call from the like. I guess the Falcons would have to be looking for a defensive player. But exactly. it's interesting at, at eight. So that that's really that's all I got for you, Frankie. I mean, I I wanted to talk about these these acquisitions and Mike Williams and Tyron Smith. What this draft mean? What this can mean for the draft for the Jets at ten? Um, is there anything else that you could see the Jets possibly addressing before we get to the draft and free agency still? 
I still think receiver is definitely a possibility. I just think if you look at the wide receiver uh, four spot specifically, and there were murmurs that they may want to move on from Lazard or completely doghouse him next year. If that's the case, you're pretty much back to where you were before free agency, not even factoring in your wide receiver uh, three because Lazard would be out and you would have no wide receiver three. Um, so I still think there's some work at wide receiver three slash four slash five. I don't know. I like Brownlee. I don't know how you feel about him, but you know how those kind of players are. You just never know. And Gibson, I mean, I like him to an extent, but I mean, there's a couple Gibsons in the NFL uh, in each division. Is he going to really differentiate himself enough? They're going to depend on him unless like a you know wide receiver four role. You see a bunch of Gibsons. He's not like a unique enough player. I think yeah. that like you could just slot him in there. So not having the second round pick sucks, man. That's why they could it trade does. back. Yeah. Do you think they should? Would you take Bowers? You didn't get it. Li- All right. So I'd have. If there's no one willing to trade up, if like if, if it lays out the way I told you, like you goes four quarterbacks, three wide receivers, and the two offensive tackles, I think you have to trade back at that point. I I I wouldn't just say, yep, turn in the car for Brock Bowers at 10. I would trade back and if it's like only three or four slots, so that way you can get that second round pick back. Because like you said, this is a wide receiver rich class. There's gonna be a ton of wide receivers in the second and third round to be able to pick from. This is a great offensive tackle class, like we talked about. So yeah, there's definitely options there for the Jets. It'll be very interesting to see when we get to that day how they decide to attack that and how that top 10 falls falls to them, you know? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think the Bowers thing, it could come out that, um, you know, he is is getting a ton of buzz in the top 10, and he might even get drafted before we're there at 10. He saw Kyle Pitts going at four. So um, I'm telling you, though, right now, man, Brock Bowers um, – I don't think he's the most prototypical tight end right. in terms of having that size and, and you know, high pointing balls in traffic and doing stuff like Kincaid and, and Hawkinson did coming out of the draft. That kid can get you yak, man. The question, though, is he going to be able to break the tackles he did at Georgia? Is he going to be able to do that in the NFL? Yeah. SEC, it, I think he know? can. I think he can. Yeah. If there's one place that you can say that, that that'll be you know conducive to doing it at the NFL level, it's the SEC ball. But NFL is different, man. It's different. That's all I got for you, Frankie. You're the man. No, you're the man, dude. And I might throw an NFL draft party either at my apartment or we're going to go somewhere. And you better be there. I know you're a big shot. Look at you now. You got the freaking skyline. Where Where are you? Are you at the Empire State Building back there? Uh, No, it's the. Uh, well, I don't know what building <laughs> that one is. I know the Statue you're, of Liberty is right over there. Oh, OK. Statue of Liberty. You're, you're just you're living the life, man. I wish I could uh wish I could be like you one day. Right. But, you know, Frankie, this as always, this team. <laughs> no, nah, listen, man, you're the best. This team always gives us content to talk about. Appreciate you as always, man, for joining us and uh, talking some Jets football. Let's go Jets, baby. Appreciate you, brother.